All right, this is Patrick Rogers, and today we have the privilege to have Mike Kading on the show. And Mike is the CEO of Norhart. Welcome to the show, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So a little bit about Mike. He's, uh, again, the CEO of Norhart. Uh, they design, build, and rent apartments. They're transforming the way apartments are built and managed by incorporating technologies and efficiencies that have revolutionized other industries and led to high quality cost effective projects. Mike's parents actually started the family business and but after a few years of joining the business, Mike's father actually unexpectedly passed away. Um, suddenly Mike had actually felt the, the weight of the world on his shoulders and he had to lead his business with no preconceived notion of right the, the way things were done in this industry. So he was struggling to the point where the city actually briefly shut him down. Uh, shattered his world. Norhart just naively started to solve problems after that incident, and, and that led to the magic. And that's when they be, started uh, changing the way construction is done, starting with an attractive culture and unique to the industry. Uh, they they started hiring the best talent, and together Norhart solved chronic construction inefficiencies, applied techniques for manufacturing, and integrated traditionally unaffiliated trades. This resulted in higher quality and lower cost projects. Norhart's mission is to solve America's housing shortage by transforming the way apartments are built and managed and doing so will improve the way we all live. Uh, I, I love that. I know we're going to go into uh, in depth on, on a lot of that, Mike, and, and how you guys have been able to create that culture and, and some of the some of the tangibles around hiring the best. Right. But before we dive into all that, what's one interesting fact about yourself that not many people know, Mike? <laughs> Uh, so I have two amazing daughters, but my older daughter, she's five years old. She's really into Super Mario Brothers, the game. And so every nice. uh, weekend now, Saturday morning, she wakes up super early, gets me out of bed, and her and I play Super Mario Wonder, the brand new game mm. that came out. It's so much fun. Awesome. Uh, and it's just kind of a fun side thing that we do together uh, on the weekends. Heck yes, I love it. What a what a great uh, kind of like little tradition, something between you and her, and just it's just pure fun. Yeah, yeah, cool. Hey man, I wanted to say you have a very uh, a very calming demeanor about you. Mm. Um, just very very stress free, very calm, cool. Can I ask? Is there anything that you do as a mindfulness practice, or anything that you've been able to kind of cultivate that within yourself and and you know, going forward? You know, uh, well, this is kind of getting into a little bit of my backstory, but there was actually a point uh, at which I had kind of a really challenging personal situation happen. And it really forced mm -hmm. me to grow and learn and become a lot stronger of an individual. One of the things that I learned through that time is that we can control our emotions. They don't have to control us. Mm, so what I learned is that, that it's the way we choose to act yeah. that actually drives how we feel about the world. It's not the other way around. Right. And so a lot of books, a lot of things I read and studied at the time, but I started applying that to my own life and realized like I have a lot of control over how I feel. And so that's kind of led to this calming demeanor of mine. Um, yeah, it's, it's really out of that. It didn't always used to be that way. Very cool, man. But some of some of the the best life lessons are the ones that are learned the hard ways, and yeah, and, uh, yeah real life lesson. Very cool. So, uh, so yeah. So, tell us a little bit more about Norhart. I mean, I, I read off uh, kind of the bio and everything else, but uh, tell us, you know, your side of uh, what you guys are doing. Yeah, at a high level, we design, build, and rent apartments, but we're really focused on driving down the cost. Of construction. Mm. Okay. We've already been achieving about a 20 to 30% reduction in those construction costs. And we believe that over time we can achieve a 50% reduction. Wow. But imagine what that means. Yeah. I mean, someday your rent could be half or your mortgage payment could be yeah. half. And yeah. that's really our dream is to solve America's housing affordability crisis. Mm. What a vision. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that, that I'm sure people on your team can really get behind. Well, absolutely. The, the, you know, my, my dad died at a relatively young age and it really reminded me how short life really is. We only live about 5,000 weeks here on earth. And I ask myself almost every day, how do I want to spend the minutes mm. that I have here on earth? 
And for me, a big part of that answer is simply that I want to make a meaningful, positive impact on the world. Mm. So that's Love really that. what drives me is I don't want to waste the time I have. I want to make that impact. And you found that making that impact through creating affordable housing and, and making it easier for the masses to get into housing is, is your impact. <clears throat> Yeah. And I would say I didn't know that originally, right? My mm. parents started this business. In fact, yeah. when I was growing up, we lost everything. My dad was kidnapped in Peru. Crazy oh my gosh. Stories. Yeah. But I, I lived with this. I grew up with it. I was swinging hammers as a kid on, on site and we had just these small buildings we built up, but I went up to school and I wanted nothing to do with the family business. And the reason that was deep down is that I didn't want people to think it was given to me. Mm. So I that makes really a lot of sense though. Yeah, yeah. I really wrestled with my own ego. Mm. But what I realized is what I just mentioned is that I wanted to make a meaningful, positive impact in the world. So why not get past my own ego and do mm. that in a space that I already have a little bit of a leg up. I mean, it was just mm. a small business, but it's yeah. better than nothing. Right, right? totally. And so yeah, then that's yeah. when I decided to jump in and gotcha. realize that I could take this to much larger scale. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and how many employees are you guys up to now? Yeah, we're about uh, 200 employees today. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And that's what that's one of the things that I think is very powerful is when the business owners or CEOs have that vision or that that legacy impact that they're mm -hmm. truly passionate about. And and that really uh, that likely aids them in attracting high quality people. Oh, yeah. I know that's one of the things that we're going to talk about is, you know, how do you actually go about hiring the best? Uh, maybe this is a great time to kind of jump into that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just reiterate your point first, which is that the greatest leaders, the companies that have the greatest success are the ones where the leader and the leadership are truly passionate about what they're doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can't fake that, in my opinion. You can. People see right through you. And so make sure that whatever you're doing, whatever you're lined up to is something that you're passionate, driven, and excited yeah. about. Yeah. But yeah, this leads to the most important lesson that I've ever learned. Wow. That is simply to hire the very best people. Mm. And when I say that, I mean the truly best. We have employees that we fly in from other states to come work during the week, and we will fly them home on the weekend. One of our staff members in 2007 Steve Jobs announces the iPhone. Steve Jobs walks off that stage and our employee walks on that same stage following that iconic announcement. It's people of that kind of caliber. And what's wow. crazy is that they unlock doors. They make things possible that you didn't even know were possible. But here's the challenge. You know, a lot of business leaders look at that and say, well, Mike, that's great. That sounds expensive. Yeah, I can't it's afford true. that, man. What are you talking about here? Yeah, and it's true. It is expensive when you're looking at it on a cost per person basis. Yeah. But what most people fail to understand is that the best people outperform the average by two to five to 10 times as much. And I've seen that over and over again. So instead of looking at it at a cost per person basis, you should look at it at a cost per unit produced. And when you look at it from that perspective, they're not your most expensive. They're actually your least expensive. So for those who fear they can't afford to hire the best, my response is that you can't afford not, not. to. Yeah, love that. I love that. And I love the, the that kind of comparison that you're making is that, you know, yes, you might pay double for this person or maybe 50% more, whatever that is, but they're going to outperform the other, the average person by two to five or even 10 times the production. And so transitioning that from, you know, just not looking at it as a unit cost, but a, but a return on investment. How, what is the production that they're producing? Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you measure that with your employees? Do you set up 
uh, OKRs or KPIs with each employee and, you know, that kind of thing? Uh, we, we do. It's not quite down to the employee level. Each okay. team has a scorecard that they review as a team. Okay. What I will say is it kind of comes through experience now. I, I've i seen what incredible teams look like, mm. right? People that are all bought into the vision. Mm. They are super connective, highly yeah. communicative. They're right. each producing incredible results of their own. They're all on the same page. They're all rowing in the same direction. And that is so rare. Yeah. It is yeah. so rare. So totally. once you've seen it, once you've been on a team of that kind of level, mm. it's intoxicating. Yeah. And then it becomes <laughs> something that you want for every for team, team in your organization. Yeah. yeah. And so, yes, we have OKRs. Yes, we have scorecards. Yes, we have measurables for sure. Yeah, sure. But I would say the bigger thing I look for is that level of caliber of team it's an intangible but I, I know what it feels like and i want that for everyone and then do you do any kind of uh analysis of behavior analysis or personality analysis when you're analyzing the teams to put the right people together yeah it's not a formalized analysis but uh this kind of ties into another key point which is yeah. that you want to identify uh -huh. people's genius I think mm. for me as an inexperienced leader, when I was younger, I didn't really understand that. I just thought I could take somebody and like tell them to go do something and right, right, right. In a good intent, they would go do it and do it. Well, there is a huge difference between someone who's just willing to do something and someone who it's their genius to mm. do something. It's their God given right? talent. Yeah. Exactly. So you right, want to right, identify right. that in others. You want to yeah. name it. You want to say what it is. Tell the team. Let everyone yeah. know yeah, yeah, yeah. this is that genius. And then align their role and what they're doing up to that genius. So I become a lot more attuned when I start to feel that the things I'm asking a particular person is not lined up that genius. And then I will back off and I'll make a change to reflect uh, to reflect where they're best at. And a, a, a sub point or a corollary to this is it's very nuanced, right? Wow. You might hire someone in marketing. <laughs> or even more specific in advertising or yeah, even more specific yeah. in Google ads. Right. Right. But their, their genius might be in the data collection side of Google ads and the tracking of it. They Got may it. not care at all and not have right. any passion for the ad copy that goes into Google ads. Right, and right. so identifying those subtle differences uh -huh. and it's not a job title, it's the differences in themselves is, is really can unlock some extreme potential for your organization. Yeah, I know Gallup talks a lot about it, and and they they say that um, the most engaged employees are ones that kind of like what you talked about that they're able to work on their genius most mm -hmm. of the time, and the ones that the people that are you know quiet quitting or just unhappy unengaged they're not they're they're doing something that is not their God given talent, and they're kind of having to force themselves to be you know halfway proficient at it. Where if they were just doing something that they or super good at naturally, they'd be way more proficient at it, get a lot done more quicker, right? Yeah. I often tell our teams or leaders, like if all you have is their hands, like their willingness mm. to go do a mm -hmm. job, yeah, you're failing as a leader, mm. right? You need to have ultimately people's hearts. And part of that's the vision. Part of that is you as the leader. And part of it's just lining them up to the right spot. And there's a Love huge it. difference in production from someone who just gives you their hands versus those who are giving their hearts. Mm. Love that. Love that. So so when it comes to hiring the best, get it, right? Find the best people. Hi hire the best people, truly the best. Like you said, the caliber of the, of the person who followed Steve Jobs on the stage. How do you find the best? Yeah, we have the same problem. Literally everyone does, especially in our industry. It's very hard to hire uh, in the construction industry. And so... We said, okay, how do we do this differently than everyone else to actually bridge this gap? And this is going to sound extreme. You don't need to go this far, but we were at our wits end. At this time, we had probably less than 100 people in our company. We hired 14 recruiters. 14. Mm. Mm. Insane. I know that's a lot. That's a but that number. changed the game for us, right? Because really? we could then start identifying 
everyone in our state who had the skill sets lined up with what we were looking for and started building relationships with them well in advance. And so that, we just ran the numbers and we realized that we would need to get to about 500 employees uh, that actually meet our values, that have the skill sets. There's probably only a thousand of them that meet the skills and the values mm. in the industry. Right. And so we had to think about the whole problem differently. Um, but it's been incredible. Uh, once we changed that up, we went from like struggling to find people and just trying to get bodies and seats to now we have an acceptance level of 0.4%. I think the average in the construction wow. industry is something like 50%. <laughs> wow. We're at 0.4%. To give you some perspective, to get into Harvard is 4%. Mm. We're at 0 0.4, 10 times harder to get into Harvard. Um, but that's changed. It's changed the game for us, right? We The team is so much stronger as a result. Wow. So this probably will blend right into, you know, how you've been able to focus on creating that culture, because that's that culture, I imagine, is what is has led to that. I mean, you basically it sounds like you have a waiting list of people to, to, to come into your company, right? Ideally. So mm -hmm. so how have you been able to create that culture over and above the things, some of the things we've already talked about? Yeah, I think the biggest piece is people. So we talked about hiring the best people, but another piece of it, this is going to sound a little bit counterintuitive, but we stole this from Netflix. It's called the keeper test. The keeper task? The keeper test. Okay, got it. And so what it is, is managers ask themselves on a regular basis, if a particular employee were to quit, how hard would you fight to change their mind? Or another way we put it yeah. is if this employee were to uh, try to get hired today, would you hire them? And yeah. if the answer is no, yeah, then they're not the right employee. Right, right. And so uh, we actually actively review that and we are constantly letting people go that no longer fit or maybe, maybe never fit. We just didn't quite see it uh, fit within the organization from a values mm -hmm. perspective, from a... Um, or a, a skill set perspective. Another thing we do is after they get hired, most of the employees, not all, but most of them go through a two week trial. And during that two week trial, it's the coworkers that make the decision if you get hired or not, right? Once you build a strong enough core team, the team cares a lot about yeah. who gets hired in that team. And wow. so they're extraordinarily picky about who they actually want on, but it's hard to know if they're a great employee unless you really get a good sense of who they are. Uh, the employees get paid and stuff during the trial period, but a good chunk of them don't make it past because the coworkers, they just, they looked nice in the interview. They said all the right things. They got on the job site and they just weren't the caliber of people that they want on uh -huh. their team. Uh -huh. um, another part of it is you as the leader have to be really aligned. Mm. You can't say one thing and do another. It's it's better if your passion is something a little bit different than the organization, just be honest about it and yeah. then make that what the organization is about. Right. Uh, rather than trying to create some organization that you think that people want to see. So being aligned with, with that, part of that is your values, right? So again, for us, the values are about trying to change the world, right? Like, um, uh, to achieve great things, to uh, uh, to improve something every day, to level yourself up. Those are our values, and they're very much reflective of who I am. But maybe, you're, maybe your values aren't to change the world. Maybe you're just trying to live a more comfortable life. That's okay. Like, your values should be about uh, work-life balance. Or maybe mm -hmm. your values are about... Uh, you care a lot about money. You know, that's not me, but that could be you. Like, be honest about that. I know lots of great people that like, that's what they say. They just want to make a lot of money. Then that's part of your values. Nothing wrong with that fundamentally. But if you specify that, then you start to attract people that are like-minded. And the key is you want a team that's cohesive on whatever values you set. If you say you're about work-life balance, but now you're asking people to work till midnight, so you can earn a big fat paycheck, you're going to have a disalignment there and you're going to have co conflicts with an organization. So it's really important to identify what those values are, codify them very simply, and then make sure yeah. the organization is aligned well to that. So those are a few things. I could go quite deep into this, but that's a, a little bit of what we do. 
Gotcha. No, I love it. I absolutely love it. And you said that the one other thing that has been kind of very significant to your to your success as CEO is is implementing lean. Mm. Yeah. So if you look at the world of construction over the past 60 years, industries like manufacturing have improved labor productivity by 760%. Agriculture has yeah. improved it by 1,500%. But during that time period, construction has done virtually nothing at just 10%. Interesting. So we looked at this and said, this is outrageous. Like, how in the world can we be okay with this? We're not. And so we said, if we're going to improve this industry, we can't look to other companies in this industry. We have to look outside. And that's where we started learning about manufacturing and the world of lean. Yeah. And we started implementing it, started having success. It's not just lean that's impl- that's driven what we've done, but lean is a key component of it. Uh, and Toyota was the world that invented lean. So we thought, right. why not just contact Toyota? And so we actually built up a partnership with Toyota. They actually fly their executives out to our sites on a regular basis to help us implement what they've discovered in manufacturing. And the core tenant of lean, in my yeah. opinion, is just to fix what bugs you right? To actually make the little improvements that eventually adding up to something meaningful. Now it sounds easy, but the key is to build a culture that does that effectively. And I think if I'm really boiling it down to probably the core issue, a lot of the times when people try to implement lean, it's actually the team lead level. It's the, the person leading the people in the, uh, the core of the work. And what you want that leader to be doing is a couple of different things. The first is to solve any bottleneck, any issue that their core team has in front of them. Uh, The second thing is training up that team. Uh, Safety is another key component of what they're doing. But the last one, the one that's maybe counterintuitive to people, is that we want 10 hours of every week from that team lead to be spent on nothing except improving their process. Mm, from the right? team lead, wow. Yeah, and at Toyota, they talk about how, we're not quite to Toyota's level, but they have 10 to 12% of their team is just focused on those kinds of roles, just focused wow. on improvement. Yeah. And most companies, there's no time on improvement. Everything is just fires that you're dealing with. Where Toyota, it's 10%, so. Wow, wow. I know what's the statistic. I think they had it in the the Toyota book, the, the Toyota way. I forget what it is, yeah, yeah. but uh, what is it? If you just do 1% improvement uh, every day, one year from now, you'll be 37 times more uh, effective at whatever you're doing. So I, I thought that's an interesting statistic. So yeah, um, and I love that book. In fact, I know uh, yeah. it was because of our connection with Toyota, I actually got to meet the author of the book. It was incredible. No way. Yeah. Oh, I have it on my, oh gosh, I forget his name, but yeah. Um, very cool. Very cool. Um, awesome, man. Well, th- this has been great stuff. It, it, let me ask you one of the, one of the questions I always ask every guest on the show is if you're going to hire a CEO to take the reins for your company, what's the one book that you'd require he or she read before taking over for you and why? No rules rules by Reed Hastings. Mm. Incredible book. Um, Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix It talks about if you can put enough rules in place, you can't put enough rules in place to govern behavior. The best thing to do, hire the best people and try to have as minimal rules as reasonably possible and encourage them and equip them to do great work. Wow. And and have as as minimal rules as possible and kind of let that run. Wow, that's fantastic. I love that concept. That's fantastic. Um, let me take a few moments, Mike, for the for for everybody, and just kind of summarize some of my key takeaways. There's so many just very key nuggets in this. I'd, I'd love to kind of summarize for for the listeners. The three main categories: hiring the best, culture, and lean. And from hiring the best, really hiring the best, like truly the best. And I think you're really the first person that's taken it to that next level where literally the best in the industry find a way to get that person. Their production will be two to five to 10 times higher than the other hire you would have had. Um, Identifying their genius and doing whatever you can to help them spend the most possible time they can in that genius. And in your case, you know, you talked about, how did you find them? You hired 
14 recruiters, and that's fantastic. Um, on the culture side of things, this keeper test, I think that's fantastic. That's a, it's a great question to ask. Knowing what you know now, uh, would you have hired them or how hard would you fight as their manager if they said they, they were going to leave, right? And and this concept of the two-week trial, I, I love that. And, and the co-workers actually decide. It's not the hiring manager, the CEO, the leader, it's the co-workers. And that's, I think that's very powerful. Um, aligning with your values, all that. And then, and then the lean, right? Lean is very exceptional. The one thing I thought that was fantastic out of there is taking 10 out. was it 10 hours of every week as the team leader yeah. dedicated to continuous improvement or improving their process, right? Exactly. Yeah, fin yeah. Fantastic. M Mike, let me ask you, if there was one takeaway that you'd really want the audience to absorb from our time together today, what would that be? Well, the big one is to hire the best, but I'll, I'll give you yeah. different ones since I've already touched on that quite a bit. You know, I have, uh, we have our own podcast and I get a chance to talk with incredible people, billionaires uh, on a regular basis. Wow. And there's a different kind of perspective these people have. And I think what happens for the average person, and frankly, the billionaires as well, is that we get in our own head. We actually sabotage our own success. You know, as a kid, we don't know anything, right? We can't walk. We can't talk. We can't right. ride yeah. a bike. We can't do in basic math. And we're okay with that. Like, we're excited to learn. We're excited to be new at things. But as yeah. we get older, there becomes a part of us that's afraid. We're afraid that if we put ourselves out there, we're not going to look very good. We don't want to do something unless we can be great at it, right? Yeah. But what these people have learned is that the ones that truly achieve great things are the ones that get out there and skin their knee and just try. They mm -hmm. recognize when they start, they're going to be terrible. And that's okay. And so gotcha. that's what I want to encourage the audience with is just jump in, skin your knee, just start. And that is the path to success. Wow. Love that. Just get in and just do it. Yeah. That is fantastic. I love that. Um, well, Mike, if any, any of our listeners wanted to reach out and get a hold of you for any follow-up questions, what's the best way they could do that? Yeah, the best way is to visit our website. That's norhart.com, N-O-R-H-A-R-T.com. And on Great. there, if you click on shows, you can see our different shows. And one of the most interesting ones there is Zero to Unicorn. It's about the journey of small enterprise growing to billion dollar scale. And one of my favorite guests on there was Michael Uslin. He's the originator and the executive producer of Batman. He also did the Lego movie, uh, National Treasure, and many others. And what I loved about his story is that when he was relatively young, he was able to just scrape by and just barely get the just the movie rights to Batman, which is incredible. Yeah. Wow. But it took him 10 years after that, 10 years of people slamming the door in his face, telling him no, telling him it's crazy for thinking that somebody could actually make a dark and serious Batman movie. That was kid stuff. That should never happen. But right. 10 years of being told no wow. before he was able to make that a reality. And wow. so it just goes to show the energy and oomph it takes uh -huh. to really fight for your dreams to make them a reality. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of like Rocky, right? I think he, yeah. how many, how many uh, producers or did he go to and get turned down? Right. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, hey, Mike, this was a fantastic episode. So many amazing things in here. You're doing amazing things with the company. Thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And for the listeners, please hit the like and subscribe button and help us spread the word about what we're doing. We're helping the next generation of leaders and CEOs be that much more successful. With that, this is your host, Patrick Rogers, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks a lot.